In the previous video for Chinese film classics, we talked about why spectacle is so important to the film New Women. The circumstances surrounding the film's production and release, especially the suicide of leading lady Ranling Yu on International Women's Day in 1935, made this film about the status of new women in modern China a sensation. We also examined some examples of how the filmmakers use cinematography, editing, and other cinematic techniques to turn the film into a visual spectacle in its own right. In this video, we'll take a close look at how New Women uses several visual motifs, including toys, photographs, mirrors, and sound, to represent New Women as being held to double standards and leading double, even triple lives. We'll also examine characterization, specifically how the film creates several models of the new woman, presenting its audience with an allegorical choice. To begin with, New Women uses visual motifs of a toy, photographs, and mirrors to convey the ideas that women are forced to lead a double life and are held to a double standard. Like in the film The Goddess, the female protagonist played by Ranling Yu is defined in relation to the roles of mother and prostitute. But Wei Ming's character is defined by objects, not just occupation. The first time we see Wei Ming in New Women, she is sitting on a tram holding a toy, the Never Fall Woman, or Bu Dao de Nu Xing, which always rights itself no matter how many times or how hard it is pushed over. The toy motif both alludes to and seems to mock women's aspirations. They exist as objects as well as subjects, not just as people, but also as playthings. Another visual motif, Wei Ming's photograph, reinforces the idea that women lead double lives, as real human beings and as images. Wei Ming's photograph first appears rather inconspicuously as a wall decoration in her apartment. As the story goes on, it reappears in many scenes above her and behind her, as if it's looking over her shoulder, as a reminder of her split selves. When the publisher handwrites the word Miss next to Wei Ming's name on the cover of her book, we see her photograph in close-up. This repeated focus on the image suggests that it is not who a woman is, but rather how she is viewed that determines her fate. The photograph of Wei Ming's beautiful face becomes a ubiquitous presence that haunts her life and even hastens her death. As people, women have their own hopes, goals, desires, and agency to realize them. As images, they are passive. People look at images, judge them, and use them for their own purposes. Adding to this irony is Wei Ming's profession as an author. She has had works published in the newspaper and is looking to publish her first novel. Yu Haicho, the commissioning editor, tells her that the press has agreed to publish her novel, but only at a low royalty rate of 10% and with no advance. Popular culture texts of the 1930s often associated women with consumption, shopping, leisure, clothing, fashion, or depicted them as objects of consumption themselves. Wei Ming, however, is a writer and therefore a producer, but she's one who is subject to exploitation. Talent alone is not enough. She will not be allowed to produce and earn until she also gives the public what it really wants to consume, which is her flat image. Put another way, the film suggests that women, even when they try to produce, are forced into becoming objects of consumption. The undertow of popular culture seems ever ready to pull women down. Around minute 12 and a half in the film, Wei Ming looks at herself in the mirror in her apartment, and then we cut to Dr. Wang doing the same thing in his apartment. So the mirror serves as a connection between the two of them. When Yu Haicho then leaves Wei Ming's apartment, she bursts into tears, right underneath a birdcage, right, a very common symbol of female entrapment, which contains a pair of birds. This lovelorn young woman sits in front of her mirror, plucking petals off a rose. Just then, we see Dr. Wang enter Wei Ming's apartment, reflected in the mirror, as Wei Ming wipes away her tears and stands up to greet him. We then cut to a reverse shot, showing the photograph and the never fall woman next to Wei Ming, as she, perhaps despite Yu Hai Cho, agrees to Dr. Wang's invitation to go out for nighttime amusement. The mirror returns as a motif later, when the editor of the pictorial magazine for which Wei Ming has been writing tries to take advantage of her financial desperation. He looks at himself in one of her mirrors and then is seen trying to kiss her in another. As the pressures on her grow, Wei Ming starts to see in the mirror not just the superficial exterior that everyone else sees, but also the pain, guilt, and hopelessness that she feels inside. 
When she agrees to be a slave for one night, as she puts it, to save her child, her sister watches the sad spectacle of Weiming looking in the mirror through the window next door. The following close-up shots we see of Weiming, who's been told to smile through her tears for a client, treat the film camera itself and us in the cinema audience as mirrors to her conscience, albeit mirrors who can only look on helplessly. These three motifs, the never fall woman toy, the photograph, and the mirror, each contribute to the pathos of the striving but fatally oppressed new woman. Mrs. Wong, the former classmate Weiming encounters on the tram, is the second type of new woman whom we see in the film. Wang Tai Tai, as she tells Wei Ming she prefers to be known now, is a woman who has married and married well. The stereotypical Tai Tai, about which I'll say more in the video on the film Long Live the Misses, is a bourgeois housewife, a lady of leisure who is financially dependent on her husband and who flaunts her superior social status through conspicuous consumption. Mrs. Wong looks down on a working class woman like Ai Ying, she rolls her eyes at Wei Ming's messy apartment, and she disdains the cigarette that Wei Ming offers her, preferring instead to smoke the superior brand that she brought with her. In Mrs. Wong's first scene with Dr. Wong, she complains to him of being a rich missus in name only, yo kuo tai tai de xu ming, having to ride the bus while her husband uses his limo. Later, her melodramatic show of sobbing over Dr. Wong's philandering ends in exultation when he promises her a new car, and it completes this caricature of the hypocritical, materialistic Tai Tai. The Aying represents a different model of new womanhood entirely. Unlike the selfish Mrs. Wong, she is hardy, extroverted, and genuine. As shown by the work schedule that she posts on her wall, she maintains an ambitious and regimented routine of teaching singing, reading, writing, and other essential skills to female union workers of a silk factory. Unlike Wei Ming, she is represented not as a flat, passive image, but as an active bodily force, one that is constantly singing, moving, gesticulating, even fighting. The first time we see Ai Ying, she is rinsing her hair in a spigot by the door to the apartment building, and she suddenly looks up to greet Wei Ming with an uninhibited smile and a wave. Cut into the nightclub scene are sequences of Ai Ying teaching a singing class, and a diagonal split screen puts these singing faces above a montage of Shanghai scenes, as if the voices are carrying out over the entire city. The contrast between the diligent study and work and the degenerate pleasure seeking is reinforced by a series of clockwise wipes over a clock face showing the passing of the night. As Wei Ming later lies in the hospital between life and death, Ai Ying tries to buck up her spirits by reminding her that suicide is the choice of the weak and will only earn scorn. But Ai Ying herself can't stay to keep the vigil. She has to go back to work. In one visually arresting scene, Ai Ying encounters Wei Ming outside of their apartment building at nighttime. And as Ai Ying walks out of the frame, her shadow on the wall looms larger and larger over Wei Ming. We have this visual representation of the strong new woman dwarfing the weak one. Ai Ying has a vision of the two of them partnering up as a productive pair. She once writes the lyrics to a song of the new woman and asks Wei Ming to score it, but it is not to be. Wei Ming's piano is repossessed soon thereafter. In the climactic and literally striking sequence when Dr. Wang forces his way into Wei Ming's apartment, Ai Ying's dynamic physicality is conveyed through the canted, close-up framing of her beating up Dr. Wang culminating in her headbutting the camera twice. The avant-garde camera angle, close distance, and movement creates a really strong sense of physical intensity. But what about Yu Haicho, Wei Ming's love interest? Yu is played by Zheng Junli, who went on to direct the Civil War era masterpieces Spring River Flows East, 1947, and Crows and Sparrows, 1949. Yu Haicho is an eligible bachelor with a white-collar job, as well as a gentleman and is therefore a perfect potential match for Wei Ming. Young and good-looking, they could become a perfect modern couple, a contrast to the decadent Dr. and Mrs. Wong. Yu Haicho, however, is no sweep-her-off-her-feet romantic. He's a moralist who dampens Wei Ming's ardor. The first time we see them alone in her apartment, it is Wei Ming who can't keep her hands to herself. She lights him a cigarette, perches herself by his side, casts a look at herself in the mirror, and invites him to go out dancing. 
She's all smiles, while he maintains this brooding demeanor and chides her that they shouldn't indulge in such hedonism. In this film about women, the man is the Cassandra figure, whose warning about moral peril goes unheeded and is later confirmed. Yu Hai Cho appears as a voice of conscience, but one who remains physically somewhat passive. He once says, I wish you could spend more time with people like Ai Ying. And indeed, when Wei Ming is threatened in her home, it is the rather butch Ai Ying and not Yu Hai Cho who comes to her rescue. The tragedy, of course, is a societal one. Single mothers are pariahs, and Wei Ming was too ashamed to tell Hai Cho about her child until it is too late. During the deathbed scene, Yu Hai Cho chimes in with Ai Ying, telling the dying Wei Ming that she'll only be able to get her revenge if she puts aside her cynicism and acts like a never-fall woman. In woman-centric films of the communist era, such as The Red Detachment of Women from 1960, a man often appears as both a moralist and a savior of women, or a catalyst to female action. In New Women, however, no white knight appears. As Wei Ming dies, Yu Hai Cho looks on with grim resignation. She once called him an iceberg, and her death proves his observation then that one can end up being cremated in the fires of one's own passion. New Women is a silent film on the cusp of the sound era about silenced women yearning to be heard. It was shot as a silent film, but with sound in mind. Dubbed dialogue, sound effects, and a soundtrack with singing and orchestral music composed by Niar were added in post-production. By the early 1930s, China was already importing foreign talkies and was on the cusp of producing its own films with live recorded sound. Dubbed films like New Women were part of the transition to the talkies, a promise realized just before the outbreak of the anti-Japanese war with films like Street Angels in 1937 and Song at Midnight, also from the same year. In 1934, when New Women was shot, silent film conventions such as heavy makeup, close-ups on facial expressions, conspicuous visual motifs, and intertitles still dominated Chinese feature filmmaking. Animated words, in Chinese characters, appear on the screen to represent important lines of dialogue. Sound is nevertheless a key theme in New Women. Two of the three New Women are music teachers. Wei Ming teaches piano, and Ai Ying teaches singing. Wei Ming and Mrs. Wang likely met in music school. In the cabaret scene where Wei Ming seems to see herself in chains, we get a close-up shot of the cover of the sheet music the orchestra is playing, the lascivious song Peach Blossom River, Tao Hua Jiang, which depicts a naked woman holding a heart. Ai Ying later tells Wei Ming that she plans to borrow the tune from this decadent song and add new lyrics that will have a redeeming social message. In real life, during the anti-Japanese war and after the founding of the People's Republic, the Chinese Communist Party would use precisely this technique of adding revolutionary lyrics to folk or pop culture melodies for propaganda purposes. The sonic motif returns with one of the most striking special effects in the film, the animated words Save Me, I Want to Live, that grow out of the mouth of the dying heroine. We see this type of animation once around minute six, when the landlady summons Wei Ming to the shared telephone in the hallway by calling out, Phone call for Mrs. Wei in the parlor. The same landlady later tries to prostitute her tenant to the caller, Dr. Wong. In this early scene, the words are visually separate from the speaker and instead are projected above the listener, Wei Ming. In the later scene, the deathbed sequence, the words burst from the mouth of the dying woman like a newspaper headline, a cinematographic effect that seems to break through the fictional story world or diegesis of the film to address the movie audience directly. The outburst is intercut with shots of factory women singing in Ai Ying's class. Wei Ming's outburst is doubly muted. She dies on the spot and her voice is silenced for good. Her daughter, of course, never even lived to become a new woman. Only the press and Wei Ming's publisher who join together to cynically throw a funeral as a publicity stunt benefit. The news of Wei Ming's death is then literally trampled underfoot, having been thrown out of Dr. Wong's limousine as he drives away with his new mistress. We cut to a factory whistle, a shot of Li Ai Ying leading a class in choral singing, and a montage sequence showing Ai Ying and her fellow workers leaving the factory. But these masses, like Ai Ying herself, remain something of a mystery. 
The closing sequence suggests that women like Ai Ying will lead China's women into the future and speak or perhaps sing for their silenced compatriots. But even then, the film leaves open a crucial question. How?